Welcome to the official podcast of Comics Beer and Sci-Fi. Brought to you by Evil Ideas, Greco Printing and Imaging, and Comics Wellspring. Before we get started, make sure to subscribe to this podcast. And follow Comics Beer and Sci-Fi on all your favorite social media apps. Now, on with the show! Hey everyone, it's Nick with Comic Experience Sci-Fi. We are at Great Lakes Comic Con, February 2024. I'm here with legendary Marvel writer and artist Bob Budiansky, and we're glad to see you. Um, tell us first, how did you get started as a professional in the comics industry? Um, I went to college, and a friend of mine from college got a job at Marvel. And when he quit his job, he said he knew he knew I was interested in that kind of stuff. He said. Um, would you like to interview for my job as an entry-level editorial assistant? And I said, sure. And I dropped out of graduate school in transportation engineering, and I took an entry-level job at Marvel as an editorial assistant. What year was that? 1976. Oh, okay. So you were there quite early, because uh, I know you were doing the writing in the 80s. Uh, was yeah, I, it, I, was, I was there for 20 years. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I did um, a lot of different things over those 20 years. Well, you didn't mention anything about being a comic enthusiast yourself uh, before you took that job. Were you, did you grow oh, yeah. up? I grew up reading comics. I love drawing comic-style artwork for myself. <clears throat> and um, got to high school, I stopped reading comics, got to college, got interested in, got interested in them again. And uh, I was a graphic arts editor for our student newspaper, so I was doing a lot of artwork for the student newspaper. So, yes, definitely had an interest. <clears throat> At the time, my friend approached me and said, you want to interview for my job. Okay, what comics did you enjoy? When I was growing up, I read uh, Justice League of America, Green Lantern, The Flash, uh, Superman. Then I got a little older, I started reading Fantastic Four and Spider-Man, started moving over to Marvel. And then, like I said, eventually I gave it up, and then I... Got back into the 70s uh, when I was in college. I, I learned about Conan. I discovered there's a whole new brand of sword and sorcery comics that did not exist when I was a kid. So I got into that. Okay. And then once you got that uh, sort of entry position at Marvel, how did your career evolve from there? Well, there were opportunities to do artwork. And I was still not really at the level where I could do professional artwork for Marvel. But I was in, a, I was in an ideal position to learn. So I was working with like Wonder. My, my boss was a had a lot of artwork experience. A lot of uh, he was a great artist himself, and I worked with art editor, um, art directors like Marie Severin and John Romita Sr. And so I was just exposed all left and right to people who were always giving me advice, great advice. So I got was able to rise to the point where eventually I was able to quit my my staff job, become a full time uh, freelance artist drawing Ghost Rider for Marvel, and then I went back on staff as a full editor. Were you a little starstruck to be working for John Romita, obviously somebody you knew from reading comics? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was amazed that uh, here I was a kid reading his comics you know, a few years earlier. Now I'm working with him. And uh, uh, in some cases, some of these people wind, wound up working for me. Like I mentioned, uh, Green Lantern was one of my favorite comic books when I was a kid. Uh, Gil Kane was the artist on that. And in the 90s, he was working for me on Spider-Man when I was a Spider-Man editor. That's amazing. It's kind of like I read Bud, Bob Budiansky as a kid, now here I am interviewing him. So. <laughs> 40th anniversary of the Transformers comic book. How did you become involved with that? So I was a staff editor at Marvel by this point in 1983, and uh, Marvel had made a deal with Hasbro Toys to develop Transformers into a comic book property and come up with a storyline for it. And um, my boss, the editor-in-chief, Jim Shooter, he wrote a treatment for the Transformers, gave it to Hasbro, I guess they approved it, and then he went about hiring um, one of the editors, uh, who had a, a senior editor who had a lot of writing experience, to develop all the characters. And for whatever reasons, that didn't work out. And then he went down from one editorial office to another, asking if anybody would take these 26 characters and come up with names for them and profiles over the weekend before Thanksgiving of 1983. And one after the other, they turned him down because it was a crazy assignment. And it finally got to me out of desperation, because I was not known as a writer editor, I was known as an artist editor. And he said, Bob, you want to give it a try? And I said, sure, I'm not doing anything this weekend. So over the weekend, uh, two of the names we had already, I came up with 24 other names for the other 20, so we had a total of 26 characters, wrote the profiles, a Jim Shooter uh, liked my work, 
gave it to Hasbro to approve. They reviewed it, they liked it, and from then on, I was the guy for the next five years at Marvel developing Transformer characters as new ones came aboard, and I wrote the comic book for about four years, and I uh, edited the four-issue miniseries that it began with, so I had a lot of involvement over those years. By the end of that span, I had named about 250 characters for Hasbro. That's amazing. Uh, I happened to, I was in high school at the time, and I was working at a toy store, and of course then the Transformer toys were made out of metal, they were very cool. How did you feel about the idea of tying a toy line to, as an, was there any artistic, like, ah, this is selling out or anything like that? Or are you like, no, this is a great opportunity to create a new world of characters? Oh, I, I looked at it as a great opportunity. I mean, I know the whole point of it, the whole point of Hasbro coming to Marvel to put out a comic book was to help them sell toys. But that was not my concern. My concern was I was presented with an opportunity, it was a challenge, I had to come up with all these crazy names and all these crazy ideas about who these characters were and what they did, and I had some experience already. I worked at Marvel by this point, uh, at this point by, uh, for like seven years or so, so I had some knowledge of these things. And so I just thought it was a wonderful opportunity. And what made it fun for me to write Transformers comic book was it was not connected to the Marvel Universe, so I really was able to just expand in any direction I wanted to go, not worrying about, uh, well, we already have you know, these characters in, the, in this world, and this dimension, and all. I didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. What's interesting about that is, is Micronauts and ROM were our toy lines, but they were in the Marvel Universe. Yeah. yeah, and actually we did touch upon the Marvel Universe in a couple of Transformers comic books. We were very naive back then. We just said, oh, let's try this, let's try that. But generally we were, we were separate, and uh, we remained separate for that, most of that time, yeah. What do you think about Transformers being, to this day, as huge as it is? I think it's great. I think it's kind of amazing. I mean, I'm kind of used to it by now, but uh, when I was writing the comic book, my only concern was, I have to finish this story so I could start next month's story. I wasn't thinking that 30, 40 years later, people would still care about this stuff. You know, comic books is a very uh, ephemeral... Ephemer cut that out. Comic books is a very ephemeral... I can't say the word. Yeah, transitory. Uh, comic books are very transitory uh, medium. You know, you read one one month, you put down the comic, you read the next month's issue. You don't think about like in 30, 40 years, they're going to still be reprinting your stuff, referring to your stuff, interviewing me about my stuff. It just wasn't in my head back then. Uh, I was just worried about what was I going to do next month. So when it came back in a big way, especially with the movies in the in the in the 2000 aughts, I thought. It's amazing. Not only are they making movies, they're making live action movies. I would never have expected that. Computer, yeah, yeah. It just, you know, just the, the the fact that it had so much life still in it all these years later, and uh, I think it's great. And uh, it's great for me because uh, I I did something that people re people still remember, and they seem to still cherish it. And they come up to me and ask me questions about why did I do this and how did I do that. And I'm always I'm always happy to speak to all the fans of the, of the work, and uh, it's great. Uh, and lastly, uh, are you working on anything these days, or are you just doing the circuit and meeting fans? Uh, this is, as my, my daughter would put it, this is my side hustle. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I do, I do conventions, I do some commissions, but I have a day job that has nothing to do with any of this, and I still have that job and keeps me sane. Okay. Thanks for talking to us, Bob. We appreciate it. Hey, this is Mark at the Great Lakes Comic Con. I'm here with Mark Hodges. He's the organizer of the Grand Rapids Comic Con, which is coming up April 12th through the 14th. Tell us I about guess. your show. Well, there's a whole ton going on with it. We've got four of the cast members from Chainsaw Man that are going to uh, be at the show. And we also have Nana Visitor from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Uh, Tony Miranda played Michael Myers, the original Halloween. Uh, a couple cast members from Teen Titans. And bigger names, Greg Sipes, who was also Michelangelo in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the 2012 version, the real good version. And uh, Hendon Walsh, who was Princess Bubblegum in Adventure Time. So there's a ton going on with it. A lot of comic guests, too. Bob Hall, George Deantre. Should be a good show. Any uh, new uh, festivities for the show, like besides the media guests, anything different? Well, we think we're going to actually have an after party this year, and it's going to be at like one of those family fun center kind of things, uh, Airway Lanes in Kalamazoo. Um, we're confirming all that up right now. 
So that should be fun for the after hours stuff, especially if you don't mind dragging the kids with you, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, we'll have a YouTube guest, although the one we recently had scheduled just canceled. So we have to, you know, rebooking is just a part of reality with doing these kind of shows. The author conference, all the other stuff that we do, film festival, 50 hours of programming, costume contests, all that kind of fun stuff. What venue are we going to be at this year, this time? The April one's going to be at the Kalamazoo Expo Center in Kalamazoo. That looks like that's going to be permanent. Uh, reason being is the uh, new building that was getting built in Grand Rapids is basically on ice, apparently, from what I understand right now, because politicians got in the way. And they, they're fighting over who's going to whiten Alpine Avenue. And it just is what it is. I mean... And if we want to keep this show at 20 bucks, 22 bucks, I can't do it at the DeVos place because it's just too expensive. Okay. It's sort of one of those harsh realities with doing this kind of thing. And uh, the Kalamazoo building worked fine for us. And the crowd we thought was pretty good for the first year. I mean, you know, we, we want to see it grow a little. But generally speaking, we were pretty happy with the crowd the first year. And um, so we see a lot of growth potential in it. So I signed a three-year lease. And the, uh, April, the November one, of course, is the big one. And we're plugging away at a lineup for that right now. Where can people get tickets? GRComicCon.com. There's also five comic shops that have tickets. Let's see. Tardy's in Grand Rapids. Tardy's in Allegan. Rocket Comics in Kalamazoo. Lang Comics in Muskegon. And the Gaming Warehouse in Granville. Thanks a lot, Mark. We can't wait to attend, and neither should you. So check out the Grand Rapids Comic Con on April 12th through the 14th. And this is Mark at the Great Lakes Comic Con. Hey, your comic book geeks and your sci-fi freaks, comic book Casey coming at you from Fantastic Con. We are in Toledo, Ohio, and I am here with my man, Dirk Manning, and longtime friend, compadre. Uh, man, good to see always, you. Again. Always seeing him Thanks around. For lunch. And after all these years of knowing and seeing this guy around, this is the first time we're actually talking this way. We always talk more high and by and point yeah, a few off, things off out. Off camera, right off camera. So go. it's nice to get to finally make this formal. So yeah, yeah kind of formal, you know, right. day, but it's kind of hard to keep a straight face because <laughs> he knows people that I know. And I'm hoping he doesn't know the stories of all and, and you, stuff. Hey, you know what? A lot of miles on the road, and we're here now. We're at Fantastic Con Toledo talking comics, and we'll leave all that sandbox talk behind us. So. Yeah, so no talk about uh, mess bucket dominate. No. Yeah. <laughs> this matter, I love you, baby. All right, so. We love you, Dom. Yeah, we love you, Dom. <laughs> All right, so why don't you tell us about this Kickstarter that you just launched in? Oh, yeah, man. So. Uh, new book, Homestead. This is a Native American werewolf western. We launched it on Kickstarter last week. Uh, you can go to homesteadcomic.com, check it out. Got fully funded in five hours. We hit 10K in pledges in the first 24 hours. We've unlocked stretch, uh, six stretch goals and, talk and counting. Real cool book, man. Uh, it's about two families, a family of settlers and a family of Lakota Native Americans and how far they're both willing to go to protect the way of life when they start to start to uh, run into each other a little bit. And uh, spoiler, there's werewolves. Yeah, I was about to ask, okay, is there a specific tribe that is the werewolf tribe or uh, is it someone wanna... that interferes with them? Well, I didn't necessarily say the Native Americans are the werewolves, did I? I, I didn't. Yeah, but no, but uh, yeah, spoiler, there are Native Americans. So, so it's a pilgrim werewolf probably in there somewhere. Well, I'm not gonna confirm or deny, no, but um, we actually in the book, um, the, the tribe that we're representing here is the Lakota tribe, the Sioux Lakota. Really honored a good friend of mine, Rao Blackhawk, who's a proud member of the Dakota Nation, came in and really served as our creative consultant to make sure. Um, I've told the story a couple times, but I researched his book for 10 years. This is a book that very emotionally investing, very important to me. Kind of a passion project. It's very much a passion project. So then when I met uh, Rao and we became friends and he agreed to come on as the creative consultant, he's looking and he's like, well, Dirk, what's this word? What's this word? And and I was shocked because like, I did all this research. I thought I had like some of the Lakota language and stuff down. And he's like, no. <laughs> but it's not on the internet. You know, which again, shocking, right? You know, the Lakota. So, so having him come in and, and, and even help me really make sure I'm framing the right way the culture so and the value. You have creative consultant. Right, the value of the Lakota people, because you're right. I mean, you know, there is an aspect where the medicine man for the Lakota tribe asks one of the warriors, he goes, are you willing to embrace the spirit of the wolf to protect our tribe? 
And uh, even little things like when they would smile about things and when they wouldn't, it, it really, I'm really glad that he came in to help us raise the authenticity of the story because that's very important, right? That representation is important and making sure that's culturally accurate. I am not Lakota, you know, I'm a middle-aged white guy from the Midwest, you know, so, but um, to have him come in and do that book with a, a, to join us for this book, it's, it's very emotionally investing, very powerful. And since you're not going to give us any spoilers uh, for because I'm very curious as to where the wolf comes from. I'm wondering if it's a colonial werewolf that uh, invades the tribe and or if it's that werewolf that's kind of like a guess who's coming to Thanksgiving dinner moment. Uh, I, I will tell you this. Uh, there will be blood. There will be blood. Will be, it's a horror book. But, uh, yeah, when when Maka um, asks, uh, are you willing to embrace the spirit of the wolf to protect our tribe from these homesteaders coming in? It's on It's on at that point, man. And, it, and you know what? I can appreciate that you actually got your insight and education on how to properly deliver the story from an actual Native American. Thank you. And that makes me feel safe enough. I have a good friend, Shadow Hawk. Shouts out to you. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to get you one of these. He's a Native American contractor, builder, very talented yeah. guy. He just helped finish my mom's basement. Oh, so this cool, is going to be a present for you, Shadow Hawk. Oh, right on, man. So Thank you. Now, Thank what you forms can we get this in? And how so? Yeah, uh, you can you can uh, back it on Kickstarter. The Kickstarter closes on April 1st. No fooling. Uh, I've, I've never had a gimmick I didn't love. You know that. Right. April no, Fool's so, Day. It's not yeah, going to yeah. be ready April 1st. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Ready April 2nd. Well, close. The book is actually fully illustrated. We're finished the lettering right now. So that when the campaign ends at homesteadcomic.com or go to Kickstarter, type in Homestead, sorry, on April 1st, the book's going to be going to print pretty much right after that. Okay. So we're hoping for so about digital a, and print. Uh, yeah, so we're hoping for about a 90-day turnaround from the time the campaign ends to get it into people's mailboxes. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, because because I guess I, I I get it. You know, people want the book. We want people to have this book. So we're usually we're looking about 30 days production, 30 days to ship it to the warehouse up in Saginaw, and about uh, 30 days to get all the books out the door. So all right. we're looking to just churn and burn it and get Homestead in the hands of the people. All right, so now are you going to be working on anything else? Because this sounds done and ready to go. So you got anything else coming up? Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, we're doing a re-release after this of a book I did that's been out of print for years called Love Stories to Die For. We're doing a deluxe edition. That's one of my only books we never offered in hardcover. We're going to be doing a, a Kickstarter for a hardcover edition of that with two bonus stories. So it's going to be seven full-length one-shots. Then in October, super stoked about this. This just gives me chills. Uh, we're doing the graphic novel adaptation of London After Midnight, okay. the last, the lost horror classic with Cheney Entertainment. So it's going to be the first of two books we're doing with uh, the Cheney Entertainment, with the Ron Cheney Jr.'s uh, estate. And, uh, oh man, again, just the classic horror fan in me. London After Midnight was a horror film that was destroyed in a fire, you know, you know decades ago. We're bringing the definitive edition of that story to a graphic novel. Well, it doesn't get more classic horror than Lon Chaney. You say Lon Chaney, exactly. come on. That goes along the lines of Bella Lugosi, you know. Exactly. It doesn't get any better than that. Exactly. So, and the fact that, you know, this film hasn't been seen, you know, in what, 70 years now, roughly. So, maybe even more than that. So, to get to bring this story to print as a graphic novel in direct conjunction with Chaney Entertainment, it's it's exciting. Everyone knows the picture of the man in the beaver hat, the guy with the top hat and the fangs and the sunken eyes. Right. You know, and now to get to have that story in print as a graphic novel, bring that to Kickstarter in October. Very excited about that. And October is a very appropriate month for something like that. Yes, sir. You, you got timed it right. You no, again, you've never been a gimmick I didn't like. Right? No April <laughs> fooling on that. No April fooling on that. So you got till April Fool's Day to get homestead, and then we're gonna be doing, like I said, another book in the interim with love stories to die for. Then London After Midnight, and then we're going from there. There you go. All right, man. Well, thank you for sharing this with us. Appreciate you. Thank and you. we're going to be excited, I especially because I have a few people I have to gift that to. Christmas is right around the corner. This is, this is going to be a good gift for Christmas. And again, this is a one-and-done horror graphic novel, too. So if you're new to my work, you know you can go to DirkMang.com, see my whole bibliography. I've been doing this 20 years. This is a one-and-done graphic novel, a good way just to jump into my work at uh, HomesteadComic.com. There you go. All right, and actually Christmas isn't around the corner, so I guess I have to give it to them maybe 4th of July present or yeah, something. But, Arbor but, Day. But days go by fast, so, you know, to be by the time April's here, it's going to feel like November. Well, I'll tell you what, Christmas will be here before we know it. Yes, so. it will. But thank yes, you, it man. It's always a pleasure. Likewise, Good man. Good to see you, man. All right. Thank you, buddy. Comic Book Casey signing off with Dirk Manning. See you soon. 
Hey, this is Mark at Toledo Fantasticon. I'm here with legendary actor Mark Rolston. Hey, how are you doing today? How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing great. great. Tell me, how did you get started doing acting? Oh, my gosh. Uh, way back when, my dad was a single parent. So he told each of us siblings, hey, you're going to do something on Saturdays. And he had taken us to the theater. And that particular theater had a child's program. And this is a long time ago. But uh, I would actually take the bus all the way into downtown D.C., do this day-long uh, theater class. And, you know, you get reaction. People say, hey, you're good. You're funny. That's how it started. Now, the first thing I saw you in was Aliens. Yeah. Now, how did you get that gig? Oh, wow. Well, you go through the ordinary process. You know, they call you up. Don't see a script yet. Not that one. Uh, but uh, we were given some sides. In fact, all of us read Bill Paxton's character, Hudson's lines, even the women. So, um, of course, we're all thinking, oh, my God, I'm going up for this really great part. But uh, in the end, after a process of a meeting, Gail Ann Hurd, then Jim Cameron, finally they hauled us in and they to Pinewood Studios to hand me the script for the first time and said, we want you to play the role of Drake. There was a caveat. I had to, like, bulk up. So I was, like, 40 pounds heavier than, you, you know, than I am now. Did you have to go through an extreme, like, Marine workout for that? Oh, I, I was eight hours a day. They had a guy training me all day, drinking amino acid drink and eating whatever the hell I wanted. <laughs> what was your reaction when that film came out and it was such a big hit? You know, I, I had no idea. I knew it was a big movie. I had no idea it was going to be a hit like it was. But, I mean, I'm telling you, uh, Bill Paxton pestered me to get to Hollywood, and I even stayed in his apartment. And within five days, I'm starring in another movie with uh, Lance Henriksen. So uh, I had no idea. But the film stands the test of time. I mean, come on now. However many years, 35 years or whatever, or more. You are in quite a few test of time style movies. Like the next thing I saw you in, you were playing Boggs in Shawshank Redemption. Yep. What was that like working with Frank Darabont? And what was your reaction when the film came out? Well, like Aliens, I knew when I, when I first read the script that it was a great script. And then you just pray that you get it. But Frank Darabont was a true uh, champion of me, an angel, and I'm forever indebted to him for it. But he fought to get me the role. They did, Rob Reiner didn't want me to be in the movie. Seriously. But Frank fought for me and got me in. And, and you know, Aliens and then that on the heels of that changed my life. But I, I've been a lucky guy. I've been in some great classic movies for its genre, like even Rush Hour is an action comedy great classic film. Oh, you were in Lethal Weapon, t Lethal Weapon 2 also. Yeah. You're the one they, they killed yeah. you on the rug or, yeah. or in the plastic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah do, do, doing a South African accent very well, by the way. Um, but also The Departed. Oh, yeah. The I mean, Delahunt. Best picture. I mean, it's um, I'm a lucky guy. Now, were you or weren't you an undercover cop? There was kind of like... They alluded to that. They weren't yeah. sure because Nicholson said, you know, that's what the cops want you to think. You know? Right, right, right. <laughs> that was one of the most interesting parts of the movie because throughout the shooting of it, Mr. Scorsese would always pass by and he'd go, Mark, so you you cop? Not a cop. And I'd go, N not a cop. You know, because in, in Boston, like being a member of the neighborhood is a really important thing. You know, like you, you, you don't rat. Like rat, rat is like the worst thing to be. It's like worse, worse than a rapist. Mm -hmm. So uh, I always said that, but then... Scorsese did a fascinating thing. You know, it took him a year to edit that movie. And that little snippet was like the linchpin to the whole weave they revealed. I had no idea it was going to be like that. In fact, I went back like five times because they kept changing what the editing was going to be like. So uh, when they put in the bit of me as a cop, that was like a total ploy by the cops to put Costello off. It, it, it's a fascinating weave, but yeah. So what was your response when it won Best Picture? Well, we, I was at home with a ton of friends, and uh, I practically hit the ceiling, so yeah. So what do you got coming down the pipeline? What are you doing now? I'm working on Bosch Legacy. It's on Amazon Plus. It's a great cop show. Uh, I did the role in the original series, Bosch, and... Um, Michael Connolly, a fantastic writer, great production team, and amazing. Um, I'm in uh, Spider-Man uh, franchise, you know, the game franchise, okay. 
and uh, the release of two last October was a huge success. It's a big, big hit, and we're going to start three at some point. I haven't heard exactly when. Uh, sadly, um, I hear they, they pushed a lot of things because of the strike, but then also they got hacked. So, yeah, I haven't heard anything for a while, but uh, there's that, and I'm working on a virtual reality game, and I can't divulge the title, but it's going to get a massive release this year, and your minds are going to be blown. It's going to flip the gaming industry on its head, and will have implications for the film world as well. It, it, we're, we're excited. We're in, a, we're in a new uh, technological age. It's amazing. So tell me, how many years have you been coming to these cons? Uh, few, yeah. So you kind of like kind of new at it. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I I used to just do very, very, very few. Um, of late, I've had opportunity to to come out, and so you know, I lo love coming out, meeting the fans, traveling around America. It's a great thing to do. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you, Mark. Uh, and uh, we don't want to take up too much of your time. And Not at all. this is Mark at Fantastic Con. That's it for this episode of the Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi Podcast. Thank you for listening, and we hope you'll join us next time.